how do we acquire a microbiome? Well, it's pretty much from the, the birthing process, from the mums. So through a, through a natural birth, whatever the mum's carrying will then carry on to the baby. And normally, there's, there's a, I have no, nothing against C-sections or anything like that. There's just a difference between the two types of babies. The babies that are naturally born normally will carry the mum's biome. The babies that are C-section born will typically carry the bacteria in the environment around them. So that's the difference that we're, we're, we're seeing in science from looking through all the research out there. Does that make sense? So no, no I've got nothing against one or the other, but just it impacts the biome for, for the child. And the other thing to note is that whatever the mum carries is what the baby will end up having. So yeah. then the, the baby gets a little bit older. It starts to interact with its environment. So it starts to play in the dirt, in the soil, and then it will start to, to get the environmental stuff. But then one point I missed is also is that breastfeeding also impacts the biome because in breast milk there's a, there's a compound called human milk oligosaccharide. And within that, it actually is not, it's not for the actual mum, it's not for the baby, but it's actually, does anybody want to guess? <laughs> it's it's for, the, for the baby's gut, the baby's gut microbiome. So isn't it amazing that you know, the way our bodies have evolved is to have this process where we can symbolically benefit from microbe and from human? Because you really think about what are we, you know, are we, we're, we're human supposedly, but more, there's more of these microbial cells in the body than there are human cells. So what really are we? So from my perspective, we are some form of symbiotic organism. There's definitely, from a DNA point of view, is even more staggering. If you look at the DNA, 99% is actually not even you. So you're only 1% you. So this is how staggering the microbiome actually is and why it excites me so much. And has anybody heard of, like, you'll see these, these new fields popping up now, like nutrigenomics, where you're starting to, to talk about how your genes work or epigenetics and how you know, your genes switch on and off and how genetics affect different parts of your health. But from my perspective, it's important to focus on the 1%, but it's far more important to focus on the 99% of the genes in your body. Both are important. But if I was going to pick one to start with, I would actually start with the microbiome because it's purely Pareto principle. Has anybody heard of Pareto principle, 80-20 rule? It's where, where you're going to get the most bang for buck in simplistic terms. So focusing on the biome is really the fast way to improve your health because it's 99% of the genes in your body. So it's a good one to start with. So the baby starts to interact with the, the soils, the water, the pets, all that kind of business. We start to get older and then we start to, to interact with our foods and you get these class of compounds that are called xenobiotics. Has any heard of, anybody heard of xenobiotics? So xenobiotics are things that can adversely impact the, the microbiome. So the, the classic one is going to be your antibiotics. So, does anybody want to guess what the biggest source of antibiotics in our sphere is, the human sphere? Does anyone want to guess? Is it? Yes, meat. So meat, obviously when you go to the doctors, you know, all these courses of antibiotics have an impact, but far more greater is meat. Because antibiotics are added into conventional meat as a way to boost the mass of the meat. So they put it into the feed, the animal consumes the antibiotic, but what they've found is that it makes it bigger. So there's more muscle, so there's more porterhouse, so there's more T-bone, you know, so there's more mass. So it's a, there's a commercial reason why they do this. They have vets on site into abattoirs and whatnot. So that is the biggest source of antibiotics. It's also things like, things that most people don't realize is, is things like chlorine in water. So a very, very important compound to add to water to control infections and spread of disease. But around 5 ppm chlorine through your drinking water will also wipe out a lot of gut bacteria because chlorine is an antibiotic. Food preservatives that keep your food on the shelf longer are antibiotics. They 
stop spoilage for food by killing bacteria. But guess what? When you consume that food, it goes into the gut and also damages your gut biome. Does that make sense? Hormones, another one in meat. It's another pro, you know, like a boosting the protein levels to create more mass. Plastics, has anybody heard of BPA you know, in plastics? Fluoride, pesticides in conventional vegetables. And finally, not many people think about this as well, it's auto intoxication. And what I mean when I say auto intoxication is I mean that when the body becomes very stressed, you know, as Aussies, we work very, very hard. We work long hours. We're hardworking people, one of the hardest working people in the world, but we're very stressed. And as a consequence of having that work ethic and, and really being at a hyper stress state, a very high cortisol level, is anybody familiar with cortisol, stress hormone? That has also been shown to disrupt the bio as well. Any questions so far? Feel free to ask me questions. Clear? Okay. And then we move on to probiotic. A probiotic means for and life. So it's something that, that we consume and it's for life. What probiotics are, are essentially bacteria. And so there's a couple of different ways we can define a, a probiotic bacteria. But how I, I revert to is the World Health Organization, which is any, any organism, could be a bacteria or even a yeast, that has some form of health benefit to the body. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's actually going gonna, gonna to survive in the gut and colonize in the gut. So that's how they define it. It's just, it could be something we call a transient. So we consume it and then it passes through. And I'm seeing this in my research in, in, at Allele Microbiome that not, not many of the, the probiotics that we consume actually colonize the gut. And I've looked at you know, hundreds of samples and I'm seeing that even, pe even though people are having probiotics, there's not a lot of actual probiotics actually surviving and, and ending up in a stool sample where we can test it. So that leads me to believe that most probiotics are actually transient. Is that something new for you guys? They're transient. So they're still beneficial, don't get me wrong. They're, doing, they're serving a purpose. They're, they're doing good things, but they're just not colonizing and surviving. So can I just ask, mm -hmm. so in that case, and this is what I, from what I've learned, maybe you can back me up on it, yep. and hear your opinion, it's like taking vitamin C, it goes in and out. So when you're taking probiotic, it goes in and out. So it's only useful at the time of taking and through its life. Therefore, we need to keep taking it because the benefits are only there when we're taking it. Is that kind of... Yep. Yeah. It's, it's spot on. It's, it's probably a, a lot more complicated than, than yeah. a vitamin C analogy. Yeah. But the, the gist that's of what you're saying is... kind of a, off the top of my head very quickly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So it, it means that, firstly, let me separate probiotic pill. So the, the ones that you take from a pharmacy or something like that, now those ones, there's only really a couple of strains that have good clinical research behind it. That's your lactobacillus GG and, and bifid, bifidobactam longum. Really, only those two have got substantial clinical studies. But the ones that do the studies are typically your pharmaceutical type companies. So there's a vested interest in that. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting is here is more what we'll touch on later is your, your fermented foods, which are far more diverse in terms of probiotics. So a pill will have maybe a couple of strains in there. If you get a really expensive one, you might get a few more strains. But your fermented foods have, you know, like milk kefir, which we'll touch on, up to 100 strains, you know. Consensus is around 50. And Michael Mosley in his book, great book if you ever want to learn about this stuff, Clever Guts, will say around 50. Water kefir is around 15. Fermented vegetables around 15. So you're talking an incredibly rich probiotic level and it's much more cost effective than pills. Cola. Yeah. And the, the other interesting thing is we always thought that the appendix was a useless, useless organ. But what we're finding now is that the appendix is like a backup source. Yeah. You might have seen this research. It's a backup source or repository that the body uses to store good guys, good yeah. bacteria that they can. Does anybody no. come across that? No. And that's, that's fascinating research. And what is also, 
Sorry, say that again? Keep all your bits. Yeah, keep all your bits. <laughs> definitely keep all your bits. And then the other interesting point with the gut, well, I remember, is that it's often called the second brain. And the reason why it's called the second brain because it has its own nervous system. You've got the enteric nervous system, the vagus nerve that connects brain and gut together as well. But new research is also calling it the second liver. Because what it does is the bacteria itself are detoxifying the body. So that interaction with all these metabolites is then making it easier for the toxins to then get sorted out in the liver. So it's a pre-step of detoxification before the liver. Is anybody aware of that? So you might not have come across That's pretty new information. So yeah, extremely important. And this is Im very important as well, because I know a lot of people, you know, they, they care about having a, a healthy body and all that kind of stuff and being, ha being a healthy range of weight. But the important thing is that the body cannot shift weight until you get rid of toxicity. Because toxicity is actually stored in fat cells. So it's a way, it's like uranium in a lead drum. The, f the fat is a lead drum. It stores the toxicity and protects the body. So the only way that we can start to shift excess weight is to really start with detoxification first. And why the gut bacteria is so important to have the optimal level is because we are trying to optimize detoxification in the body. And then when you do your exercise protocols and your, you know, your portion controls and all that kind of stuff that is good for weight loss, now the body will actually let go. If it's toxic, it won't let go. Because the priority of the body is not for you to look better. The priority of the body is to keep you alive. Survival. And if your body was going to release all this toxicity, it goes to your brain, it goes to the body, you die. So toxicity first. Is that clear?